All right, good evening, everybody. I hate to break up the fellowship because it sounds like it's going well. Um, but my name is Pastor Dwayne. I'm filling in for Pastor John tonight. He's having the hard task of doing marathons in Oregon and rock climbing this week. So um, from what I saw, he was really enjoying himself. And I think we're enjoying ourselves in the nice sun here in the Northwest as well. So glad to have you tonight. Um, let's start with prayer, and then we're going to be in the book of Jude. Lord, we just pray that as we open your word tonight, that you would just be in our midst. We just want to dive in. I think it's a word that we could use right now. It's a reminder that we can use right now. And God, I just pray and just invite you here, God, let every word that's not of you just pass from my lips, God. We just pray that your word would resound in our hearts and let us leave here changed and not the same as when we walked in. God, just let us renew our faith to face another week. Let us renew our boldness in you. Let us renew our spirit in you. God, and help us to face the days that we have coming ahead. And Lord, we just thank this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I'm going to take on the wonderful book of Jude. It's very long. It's only one chapter. Um, but as I was studying, I was saying, could I get this done in one night? So when I looked at how fast Chuck Smith did it, he took an hour and 45 minutes, I think, to an hour and a half. And Chuck Lynn did it in two weeks, so maybe I'm biting off more than I can chew, but we'll find out. So, um, so go ahead and turn to Jude. We're going to start with chapter or verse 1. And he opens his book by saying, Jude a servant of Jesus Christ, and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Now, there is nothing in Scripture that is wasted. This is a really, really important introduction. He, he calls himself the brother of James. And I want to read something out of the Gospel of Matthew because it, it shows you how... When men get involved with interpreting Scripture for their own gain or for their own purposes, we can get it wrong. So Matthew 13, 55 says this, Is not this the carpenter's son? So this is the people talking about Jesus. Is this not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, or Jude? So right off the bat, this already points out that this is the half-brother of Jesus, Jude and also James. He has a book in the, in the scriptures that is his. But the first thing I wanted to point out is there's other religions that talk about how Mary's perpetual virginity remained after the birth of Christ. That's how she gets her deity. Well, you can see already that's fallible doctrine. The Bible is clearly he had other brothers. She had other sons. And this is kind of going to go right along with the topic of Jude, of how false teachers can come in so gradually, make it sound so good, but get it completely wrong in error. And we know that James is actually probably the more well-known brother. Jude is probably the younger one. And James, uh, we read about him in Acts, Acts 15. He's the, the head of the, of the church council at this time when they brought the Gentiles in. And they asked him, well, what do we do with the Gentiles? What do we keep them, the practices? And he's the one who stood up at the end of after hearing everything. And he gave the final ordinance that they didn't have to do all the customs. He gave them a couple things to stay away from idols and sacrifices that still had the blood in it. But he was the one who made the ultimate decision. So he had a pretty uh, prominent leadership role in the early church. And when you look at that and you look at the book of Jude, it doesn't paint the whole story because Mary's other kids did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They grew up side by side with him every single day and they did not believe him. John 7, 5 says it, for not even his brothers believed in him. That would be a difficult ministry that your family wouldn't even believe that you're the Messiah. But mom shared the story, how the angel came, how she didn't have a biological father to contribute to this. It was all the Holy Spirit, and they still didn't believe. And it was that unbelief that held, or kept them and held them and had them miss out on all the blessings of growing up with Jesus, the Messiah. Imagine how much they could learn years and years with him at his side. But unbelief kept them from that. And that's what unbelief does. When, when we're in unbelief, it takes the focus off of God, who it belongs onto, who we're supposed to put all of our trust, all of our rest in, and then we start looking on ourselves, our weaknesses, or our example. Well, he's my brother. Why, why can't I be the Messiah? Why, why aren't I the chosen one? And it just removes the responsibility of who it belongs to of God. It puts it on ourselves. It causes unbelief. But I have a little bit of 
uh, empathy with these guys. Now I have two older brothers, okay? And we are competitors. You can look at my size. We're all football players. We all grew up. Uh, we always were out trying to do the other one. If it was motorcycle competitions, whatever it was, we were competitors. And if one of those guys walked up to me and said, I am God, that would not have went well in my family at all. It, it just wouldn't have. So when I think of what the brothers of Jesus must have thought when they were with him, how difficult it must have been. The Bible says he knew no sin. He, he had not sinned. Man, I'm getting in trouble, but this guy isn't. Like, Mom, come on. No, that's God. I'm not, no, not going to happen. And he can't lie. So I can, I can say, okay, who broke the dish? And we're all lining up. Wasn't me. Wasn't me. Wasn't Jesus. Jesus, you're dismissed. I got you four guys now. <laughs> like, that would have been a horrible treatment. And then at age 12, he's already wiser than the temple leaders. That would have been a hard brother to be in the shadow of. So you can see where... The only thing I can think of when I thought about this in my mind was good grief, Charlie Brown. Like, you know, it's like our family, we always thought, somebody always thought they were self-righteous, but Jesus was actually righteous. That would have been difficult to stand beside him. But something happened dramatically with the brothers after the resurrection, because we start to see their ministries. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, now remember, his brothers did not believe, but it says he appeared to James and then the apostles. So Jesus is raised from the dead. The first person he runs to is probably, um, because of the names, the way they're written in order, James would have been the next oldest one. He ran to James first and said, look, I'm alive. Everything that you wanted me to show you, I am now free to show you, and I wanted you to see. And they believed. And with that encounter, their lives were totally, radically changed for the gospel's sake. And I like how Jude also opens here. So we know he's the brother of James, but James opens to his the same way. They don't call themselves brothers of Jesus anymore. They say, I am a servant of Jesus. So this relationship has changed. In the Greek, it's the word doulos. It means bond servant. It means I have chosen that Jesus is no longer just my brother, but he is my Lord and my master. My life belongs to him. So what a radical change it was for these two brothers to come to the knowledge that Jesus was Lord, was Messiah, and I, it just it confounds me because I have to think about how much love did Jesus show to James when he showed up. When he showed up, but he didn't come in and say, I told you so. so I, I, I told you to believe this whole time. He didn't rub it in his face. Something happened in that interaction of such love that James and Jude knew, yep, I missed it this whole time, but now my life is yours. And he describes who he's writing this letter to. He calls us the called, the beloved, and the kept. Called, it could be sanctified in the New, New King James Version as well, but it just means to be set apart. It's those who have answered the call of Jesus to repent, confess, and believe in him and follow after him. So it's, the, it's those that are believers. He also calls them beloved. So those who have actually received that God reaches out his hand in love, they received it. And they're also kept. So we have those who have eternal salvation and security. So he's just simply talking about believers. But these three words are so important. If you notice, they're all past tense. Jude is about to talk about something very deep. So he wants to make sure, as soon as he opens the letter, look guys, everything, I want to reassure you, if you believe in Jesus, you are called, you are beloved, and you are kept. The work is done. It is finished. He did it already. And then it's also passive. It, it shows us that God did the work. We had nothing to do with it. So he opens up by saying, you were totally secure by God's work. It had nothing to do with you. And he's just doing this reassuring opening. And I guarantee you, it had to be the same way that Jesus, when he came to him and James and those guys, he reassured them, you know what? You didn't believe, and that's okay. I still love you. I still love you. And this is the way he's opening. So as we get in the, chat, in the verse 3, he starts this really vivid graphic warning uh, picture for us of not only the end times, but it was already going on in the first century. This was happening then and now. So as you'll see, not much has changed in 2,000 years. So let's look at or continue on in verse 3. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our, com our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith. That was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed. 
who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So he, all, he just, this is the easiest way to talk to people. When we just talk about Jesus and we talk about the easy things, we have salvation, that's the safe zone to talk. But he's about to talk about something that isn't easy. And you always hear the saying, well, if we don't agree on everything, we can at least agree on, on Jesus. And this isn't the conversation he has. This isn't about spiritual gifts. This isn't about style of preaching. This isn't whether we play musical instruments in the service or not. This is something greater. He's actually going to take a stand against sin and call it what it is. And as I was thinking about this, this relationship that Jude it had, it had changed in him. And as new believers, I always teach the new believers class that if you want to know if you have a, a relationship with Jesus Christ, it's because your relationship has changed where He is Master, He is Lord in your life, and the old relationship with your old Master, sin, has radically changed. You don't even like Him being in the room with you anymore. You can't tolerate it. it it's not part of you. It's not who you are. I don't want to bow to you anymore. That doesn't mean we just don't stumble and fall, but the relationship has changed. It, it's just not the same. And I love how he opened this. He wanted to talk about it, but the Holy Spirit had to step in and say, Look, I'm going to change the topic on you, Jude. This is what we're discussing tonight. And that had to be so uh, a heart ready, a heart humbled to talk about this for Jude. And he addresses the claim, those who claim to know Jesus, but still have the same relationship with sin that they had going into, quote, I know Jesus. We're under grace. We're, we're proclaiming that no matter what we do, we're under God's grace. It covers it. But Matthew 6, 24, this is Jesus talking, says this, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Now that's a clear message. And the question I want to ask tonight, when we leave here, who are we going to serve when we walk out the doors? Who's going to be our Lord and Master? And I think we have that answer already set in most of our lives. And if you haven't, we'll talk after service. But my hope in this message tonight is to encourage you that when you walk out of here, I was serving the right Lord, the right Master when I walked in. And now I am refreshed. I'm reboldened to go back out and say to the world, I'm still serving the correct Lord, the correct Master in my life and what He's done for us. And I was watching over the, the news this weekend, and I was watching individuals use this same tactic, using God's grace to promote everything from political views to different arguments to different movements in the East and to the, to the South. And they were actually using words. These aren't even Christians, but they were using words strong as this, God would want us to do this. As if they were spokespersons for God. And it was literally, it came from outside the church as well as people from in, inside the church. And we have had many discussions all week long of people rising up and using God's grace improperly. They're using God's name and they don't even know Him. And this is what Jude is asking us to be careful of. So Satan started out by persecuting the church outwardly. I mean, he brought uh, Saul right off the bat. You know, we had Stephen martyred. Um, the apostle James, different than the brother of James, was killed very early on. He was beheaded by Herod. He brought numerous persecutions. And what happened? The church grew like wildfire. It didn't matter what Satan threw at it. So he reverts to plan B. He decides, well, not only will I attack them from outside, I'm going to join the church. I'm going to put people inside the church to bring up a doctrine and confuse and confound the weak. And I'm going to watch when people get complacent and I'm going to very easily slip it in because Jew called it unnoticed. They did not notice. And Paul also warns against this. He was sternly talking to the church of Ephesus, the elders in Acts 20, uh, verse 29. So he's talking to the elders of the church, not just the congregation, not just a new believer. He says, I know that after my departure... Fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. So we understand and we know there will be times that there will, people, there will be people, there will be leaders of churches who will stand up and profess and proclaim that they know God and they will twist and manipulate the word. And Jude is saying, watch out for these guys. 
It was happening in the first century church. It's happening today. There's nothing new. There's nothing to be shocked or worried about. God is still in control. And I like this because he tells us that we are to contend for the faith. And I've always heard this. This is, when we think of contenders, well, I, always, I thought automatically Rocky Balboa, okay? And I'm like, yeah, we're going to contend for the faith. We're going to throw some punches and fight for the gospel. And the Holy Spirit just said, dig deeper into this word. And the root meaning for contending is it's, it was used for a gymnastics word. It meant to enter the competition. It was to get involved in the competition. And I quickly thought about when I was coaching football. Um, there would be times when I saw these kids in school, these monsters of the midway, and they weren't coming in signing up for practice. I mean, they had the physical ability to, to play. They had the, they had the right stuff. And they would just sit and like, nope, that's not for me. I, I don't know if I can do it. And I'm just saying to myself, I know you can. You are built for it. You are made for it. So when we're talking about contending, Jude is saying, look, whatever's going on, believers, there's a lot of you that are complacent and that are sitting on the sidelines. You are not contending. You are not getting in the game. You are not sharing your faith. You are not living your faith. You're doing it behind closed doors. You're doing it quietly. You're not stepping out. So I need you to get into the game. And this is what Jude is talking about here. And I love it because despite what happens in the world, okay, the gospel has never changed. It's the same message 2,000 years ago. It is still today transforming lives from utter darkness, utter despair, with no hope, into, look, I am now a son and daughter of Christ. I have walked away from sin. I am marching through. I, I have a different relationship. And our mission is still the same today, Wednesday, as it was a week and a week and a half ago. It has not changed, guys. I, I like verse 4, because he says, they were condemned from the beginning. And then he starts in, in verse 5 talking about, okay, look at the Old Testament. God has condemned this from start to finish. Nothing has changed. So we need to remind ourselves the outcome of those who compromise the gospel, of those who compromise the message. And then we need to take relief that God is still in control, no matter how crazy the world spins. So let's pick it up in verse 5. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left, prop, left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. See, they didn't like the light, so what a place for those who don't like the light. He put them into outer darkness. Verse 7 says, now referring to, this is interesting, depending upon what language you use, yours might say likewise, this one says just, but he's saying as the angels in reference to this, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise, so the angels did it and Sodom and Gomorrah did it, indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So we have three characteristics here. The first one, we have the children of Israel. What did they do? Moses was gone for 40 days. Wait, God, God must not be here anymore. We must, things have changed. It's only been 40 days. Let's make a golden calf. Okay, we're going to worship a different God now. Things have already changed. His word did not stand true. It only lasted for 40 days, okay? So they make a calf, and Moses comes down off the mountain, and he says, what have you done? And he makes them choose, who are you going to serve? Even in, even in front of God, after walking through the Red Sea, after seeing all that he did in, in Egypt, all of that, he says, who are you going to serve? And over half stepped over and said, we're not going to serve him. And what happened? The ground swallowed them up. They were judged because their sin, not because they failed or had a mistake. It's because their relationship with sin had never changed. They still, this was my master. I know what you've done for me. I've seen it. I know it. I understand it. But I still choose this. I still choose it. So rebellion was the first characteristics of these individuals. The second one was, he talks about how the angels left the position of authority. They left glory. They left holiness and righteousness. And they, they, they moved out of there. And that is something that we have to be careful of because there's always something. So they're sitting in heaven and it says they were watching the daughters of man and desired them. 
So something that they should have had their eyes on what they're supposed to be doing, their mission, their task, what their job and role was in heaven, but they weren't. They were just looking and just not focusing on God, not focusing on Jesus. It tempted them. They were tempted. And they left their authority. How easily, if you watch the road of someone who walks away from the church, they start putting things in they shouldn't watch, they shouldn't hear, they shouldn't see, and eventually doing. And it's not legalistic. This is a warfare. This stuff that Jude's talking about came in unnoticed, and we say, I'm calling you to watch out for it and guard against it. The third thing that we see is they indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah is a lot like America. They were wealthy. They paid people to do the work for them. They became so wealthy that they became idle. Not idol worship. They became lazy. They became, I'm bored. What do I do? And there is a warnings all throughout Scripture about especially men and then also women that become bored. They get in trouble. Okay? They find things they're not supposed to do because they're not filling it up with the things they're supposed to be doing. So, and you, if you read Psalms 1, it has this beautiful picture of this person who, it says the unrighteous, they'll stop running, then they'll start walking, then they'll eventually find themselves standing, and then eventually sitting in sin. It happened gradually. They didn't even notice the process. They found themselves in compromise, and they found themselves surrounded by it. And they were okay with it because it tainted them over time. It wasn't a quick process. It happened slowly. And we know from Scripture that the biggest sin in Sodom and Gomorrah was homosexuality. It was a sin in the Old Testament. It's a sin in the New Testament. Romans talks about it. There's no denying what it is. It's a sin. But I think a lot of times what we get in our heart is it's the main sin. And no, the Bible isn't the Bible versus homosexuality. It is one of the sins. And it has horrible repercussions. But... God came to reconcile all sinners to himself. He came that all might have grace and, and have now a different relationship with him. He can take the worst of the worst in our minds to him. It's just sin. I want to pull them out of that. I want them to no longer have a relationship with that. And I want to transform them. And this is what Jude and James are talking about in their passages be doers of the word. Be walkers of the word. Have faith that when you evangelize, when you talk to people, that they will receive the call. Not everyone will. But have faith that God is working in them. And I like this because in this scripture, he doesn't just point out homosexuality. He calls it sexual immorality. Okay? So he's actually calling all sexual sins to the carpet. He's calling the sexual sin of adultery. To the carpet. He's calling the sexual sin of sex before marriage, heterosex even, before marriage. It's a sin. Improper use of the body in sex, he's calling to the carpet. He's ca calling to the carpet pornography, the mind leading to lust. He's calling all of these things to the carpet. And if you realize this, the whole thing that we're dealing with right now with same-sex marriage it's the same way that every other thing entered into our culture. It was gradually introduced. It was gradually accepted. It was gradually a funny joke at one point, And now we're living it as reality. But it's all sin. We should have no tolerance for any of it. But that doesn't mean we don't love the people. Okay? Our message has not changed. Sin is sin. And why is sexual sin one of the most prominent things he's pointing out here? It is the most easiest to become our master. It controls. I counsel people. I talk with people who say, I just can't help myself. I'm controlled by it. Well, when we give over to it, it becomes our master. And it leads us around like a puppy, unfortunately. It does. It becomes us. And in Philippians, Paul says they were actually controlled by their belly, their appetite. It controlled them. It was their God. So how easily, just by not watching, becoming complacent, and watching it come by without contending for the faith, without stepping in the game saying, no, this, this is how we believe. Let's pick it up in verse 8. Yet in like manner, these people also relying on their dreams defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, 
was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understanding instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. So there's a couple of practical things. When we're dealing with people that are stooped in sin, when we're evangelizing to them, we have to watch for these things. They will rise up, okay? And it will tell you, okay, this is time. I've hit this wall. I've hit flesh. And he points it out. He it says it's like Cain. So he was jealous and angry of the favoritism they had, that Abel had toward God. And he killed his brother over it, okay? So there's a wall. He's responding in flesh. They're like Balaam. So you have these... Again, the people that we saw in the news, leaders of the church, that they call themselves the church, standing up. Balaam was a false prophet, and he was in it. He gave, he had a legitimate gift from God. He was legitimately called, but he did not answer it. He used his gift for wealth. The kings paid him off to proclaim either blessings or cursings on people. So he was using it for wealth instead of for the Lord. So that's the second thing. The third thing, he calls him like Korah. So again, this is a huge thing. It goes right back to rebellion. Korah rebelled against authority, didn't like it. He second-guessed Moses. Why are you putting your brother in charge? It should have been me. I'm just as qualified. Why, why am I not a leader? So again, he was wanting to glorify his name instead of whose? God's. And that's what these individuals are doing. So when we start to talk about them, we can start seeing signs of the flesh. It's not ready yet. The Holy Spirit has not worked on their heart. It's not time to witness to them yet. Because Proverbs says if we rebuke a scoffer, he's just going to end up hating you. Okay? They're not ready for it. But it doesn't mean we don't back down. We just don't throw punches. We're not the contender like Rocky. Okay? We are to be engaged and running at full speed. So I want to look at to how, um, so we know they're operating in the flesh, these three ways, but also I want to look at the works of the flesh in Galatians, because it'll really point out something to you guys. So this is Galatians 5, 19 through 21. It says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of angers, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, Envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So these are the characteristics of someone operating in the flesh. So when we see it publicly displayed in front of us, it should not shock us because we understand they are fully given over to the flesh. But it still does not change my calling as an ambassador. And they respond impulsively. And I got to thinking about this, like this animalistic nature is what he called it. And have you ever had a dog that you didn't know really well? And they were eating, and somebody, or I did this young once. I never did it when I was older. But I decided, hey, you're making a mess. I'm going to move your bowl over somewhere else. So I put my hand in front of the dog and removed the bowl. Well, I have the scars to show what this animalistic nature is like. And the dog knew me. Okay? The dog knew me. But that's the point. They're not reacting to you. They're reacting to the flesh. They're reacting to sin. So when they're responding out of hate and anger, like we talked about with Cain and these guys, you have to be careful. Okay? There's a point only so far you can go. Jesus never forced himself on anybody when he was in Jerusalem. I would have loved and longed to gather you like chicks under a mother hen's wings, and I would have brought you to me. But you won't let me. And that's okay. That's okay. I'm not going to force myself. And that's the beauty of Christianity is we don't force the gospel. People respond to the gospel message. But our message hasn't changed. And he also talks about how they're boisterous, speaking evil of authorities. And they're talking about authorities in earth and on heaven. So it gives us the example of Mike, Michael the archangel, how he responded to Satan when he was disputing with the bones. Now we know in Genesis that um, God allowed Moses to die away from Israel. And then apparently in this scenario, he's the one who sent Michael to gather Moses and then bury him. Well, in this kind of uh, 
ceremonial thing that he's doing for Moses, Satan shows up and he is arguing with Michael over the bones of Moses. And it says he did not bring a railing accusation against him. He's like, you know what, you old slew foot the devil. You are bound in chains. And he didn't talk to him like that at all. He said, the Lord rebukes you. He left judgment to God. But he still did his, what he was called there to do. So he didn't argue with him. He didn't do. He just stood, said, this is what I'm called to do. And the Lord rebukes you. He left it to him. And as we learn in Philippians, the whole mind of Christ, our example here on earth, is humility and servanthood and respect. Okay? Not tolerance, not complacency, but they do it in respect. And out of everything, like Corinthians says, everything that we do must be done in love or it has no result. We might have well not have done it. So when we contend for the faith, we do it with respect. We don't back down. Just like Michael and Jesus. Remember Jesus as well? He didn't, do it. he didn't do it either. How did he respond to Satan when he was being tempted? Just the simple words of God. He let it go. This is what God says about it. Same thing that Michael did. The Lord rebukes you. Okay? That's not my role to play. I'm not Savior, and I'm not judge. I'm an ambassador to tell you about the Savior and the judge. And then we leave it to, the, to God to do the rest. So they gave the message in love. Uh, verse 12. These are hidden reefs at your love feast, as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. Again, the stars are representation of the angels um, that he's going to cast into our, outer darkness and has already done so for most. So we have this hidden reef. Now, it talks about it in love feasts, but usually a reef is something that is hidden under the water. That's kind of where this uh, terminology has come from. And what do reefs do if you don't know about them on a boat? They will sink the ship. Okay? So what do we do? We put lighthouses up. We show the way. We show the clear barriers. And if, our, if we're not watching for the lighthouse, if our eyes are not fixated on where we're supposed to be in the water at all times, we will hit the reef. It will come up and will surprise us. And this is what it's describing these individuals as. They will lay in wait and they will sink the ship. Quietly, you won't even notice them until you run aground on them and it's too late. He's saying to watch out for them. And Jesus is literally the lighthouse. So how do, we, how do we watch out for these people? Should we be focusing on them? No, that takes our eyes off. It says in Hebrews 12, 1, 2, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run the race with endurance that is set before us, looking to Jesus. Everybody say it with me. Looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith. He started it. He finished it. He's even the one who provides our faith for us to even do this. Such a beautiful picture. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father on the throne. So we are to run this race. We are to pray. We are to get into the word and to the right fellowship and be careful when Satan tries to enter in through the fellowship, he will bring those in. And I remember sitting in a, we call it the seven deadly viruses at a church long ago. And I remember a gentleman who came in and we were talking strictly how it is set in scripture to get to heaven. It's only through the name of Jesus Christ. You cannot get there any other way. He did the work. And the conversation got off on, well, what about Mormonism? And we just started talking about some of those things that why they don't believe that Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life. And another gentleman stand up and just quickly just said, well, I have a lot of Mormon friends who are really good people. And I had to think about that for a minute. And I wasn't the leader. I was actually in the class. And I remember, is this my place to, to say something or should I wait for the leader? I took the leader for a minute, but everybody else got really quiet because they didn't want to talk about someone's good status in someone else's eyes. But the, the leader just kind of took a minute to breathe and he said, you know what? I have a lot of loved ones who are good people. But if they don't accept Jesus Christ, they're going to hell as well. 
So he compared it. He put himself on the same level. He gave himself a, a minute. He didn't respond out of anger. He didn't respond quickly. He didn't act like the flesh. But he responded in the correct way, and it hit the man head on. And he had to come to grips with it. This isn't about a, them and us. This is all of us. We're all in the same boat. The people I love and cherish, if they don't choose us in the same boat as everyone else. And he calls them that these, these individuals are like foam of the sea and uprooted trees and waterless clouds. It, when I looked at this, it's, it's, if you've ever been around a crashing wave, it has a very strong presence. It, it sounds loud, it's roaring, but literally if you're standing on the mountaintop, it has no substance, it can't do anything to you. It's just a noise off in the distance. And we can be intimidated by the waves, and I remember reading over the years, a few people who always got fascinated with the waves and they would walk up to the edge and they'd get really close and they would be focusing and they would just fall over. The silliest way to die. I just fell over staring at the waves off the cliff and they swept me out. And this is what we have to be careful of because Hebrews tells us our eyes are supposed to be on Christ. He's the rock. I've got my eyes where I'm supposed to be standing. This is where I'm anchored and rooted. I don't care about that. That's the same thing that led the angels away. They started looking at something else that they did not have authority to look at, and it became an idol to them, and it led them away slowly from God. So I want to say sin... Sorry, lost the place for a second. So we are called to be ambassadors. And again, I want to say God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And I love what uh, John writes here, the Gospel of John 15, 18 says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. That's Jesus. That should not be a surprise to us. Nothing should come as a shock. This is a, this, the Gospel message is a stumbling block. They have to fall on their face in front of God. And if they don't, it crushes them. They can't handle it. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. I'm thankful for the fact that we have to draw closer to God now more than we ever have to be able to be evangelists, to be able to preach the gospel with boldness, to be able to preach uh, or proclaim anything out in the open, to be able to go to the grocery store and proclaim our faith. We have to draw closer to Him now more than ever. That's the only thing that I think is beneficial from this. It will draw us. It's a promise. He will draw us closer to him. So let's pick it up in verse 14. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers malcontents, following their own sinful desires, they are loudmouth boasters sh showing favoritism to gain advantage. Now we, we read about Genesis, we read about Enoch, it has a couple verses in there that he was taken up. But he was a symbol of the early church. What happened right after him? Not too long, he was right before the flood and the judgment that came. It says in Hebrews 11.5, it also gives us a verse about him. It says, by faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. The judgment that was coming, he was snatched out. It says, and why? It says, and he was not found, so he was pulled up, because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. That's a symbol of the church today. What pleases God? Faith. That's it. Our faith in him. So he gives us an Old Testament uh, analogy here of New Testament, we are waiting on Jesus. We are waiting for the rapture. If he comes before I die or after, the, after I die, that's fine. But until then, I still have a work to do. God knows exactly when he's coming back. He hasn't missed a step. He's not lagging behind. He is waiting till every person that he has destined to know him has come. There's a Gentile out there, it says in Romans, that when that Gentile comes to the Lord, bam, we are out of here. Okay? So that should give us more boldness to go out and say, look, I'm looking for that last one. I want to go home. I want to go home. So he was taken before the judgment. He was taken before the flood. And remember those angels that left the, the holy place. It talks about in Genesis 6. They, they came down to be with the daughters of men. It started with that. It was, a, it was sexuality and, and, and as far as sin is always one of the first segues into all in all out rebellion. Okay? 
So that's what happened in Genesis 6. They came down, they slept with the daughters of men, they bred giants, and then just evil just burst across the world. And who came quicker? God said, I'm coming. I'm going to bring judgment now. It has got to the point that I have to step in. So we can rest in that God knows what time to judge. He will be there. But until then, we are still on mission. We are still to contend for the faith. Verse 17, But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, In the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. We look outside. I see scoffers. I see people following ungodly passions. I see it all. So what, what time is it, church? We are in the last days. There is work to be done. Time is short. We don't need to be licking our wounds like a boxer sinking back into our corner. Okay? That's not this time. This is a time that he's been preparing us for. This is a time that he's had this church for 30 years feeding you for and getting you equipped for such a time as this to be able to step out in this community today and do something about it and not to slink back. And I just love this because that's just a constant reminder the Bible is true. Right here is just another prophecy that is coming to pass. We're seeing it right in front of us. We're living it. In verse 19, he goes on to say, It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. So we are called, Philippians does a great job of it, but we are called to be a unified body of Christ. Okay? And right now, the attack is, let's divide the church over this silly subject. Well, the subject is sin. We should stand firm where sin belongs is outside the body of Christ. Okay? Now, it doesn't mean we don't love people, we don't welcome them in, we don't tell them about Jesus, but as far as me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. That stays outside. So that our, the plan is exposed in the first century church. It hasn't changed. It's still that way. They're trying to creep things in and say, look, I'm going to cause division. Because why? Philippians teaches us when the body is unified, when the body is one, it is the most glorious reflection of Jesus in the world, and people are drawn to the light. That's why the church in China, when they were persecuted outwardly, what happened? They were unified inside the church, and when people said, no, you're going in there with six people, and it's not going to make a difference, when they walked out and came back later, and there's millions of believers out of that first little group that went in, why? Because they were unified to glorify Christ in the middle of persecution right where they were at. The body is designed to be a reflection of Christ. So that means we need every believer every spiritual gift that is in the body to be answer the call, contend for the faith. Get in the game, Jude is saying. Verse 20, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. That's what we're waiting on, the mercy. And it's important to remember, this is vital. We are not alone in this. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, stayed out of heaven. Okay, He came down. Jesus went up. Holy Spirit came down. He has walked with us every moment of every day, whether we recognize His presence or not. He has been with us. He has not left us. Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. There is power in the Holy Spirit, and it is vital that we have to understand that. We have to be on our knees. Lord, fill us. Lord, equip us, which he's been doing. Now, Lord, give us boldness. Give us the words that is say. Give us discernment. And we can't be disillusioned by unbelief because we're looking outside at everything else. Well, did I really have it right? Did I really understand that passage right? Yes, you did. Everything is coming to uh, fruition that exactly the way he said it was going to. Don't be surprised. Don't let it alarm you. Especially when Jesus is sitting right in front of us. We have the Word today, and we have the Holy Spirit sitting right beside us, and God still sits on the throne. Verse 22, And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by flesh, not the individual, the garment stained. Matthew 16, 18 says this, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and on the gate, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. So where is the church positioned? Right at the gates of hell. 
That's where we are losing people too when we don't witness, when we don't do what we're called to do. That's where people's going. That's a reality. John has taken four weeks to teach on that on Sundays. It is a reality. And I think we've forgotten where we're ambassadors at. Okay? Our citizenship is in heaven, but we're ambassadors right here on earth, right where the gates of hell open up and say, look, I have enticements for you. I have pleasures. And people are walking blindly every single day, following their stomachs, their desires, right into it. This is not the time to back up. And I know, it, I love this, because, yeah, you're probably going to smell like smoke after witnessing to people. Okay? We're getting to that point. And often when I'm on the street and I'm dealing with people that are stooped in drugs, or do, they're stooped in everything that you can think of, I smell like them when I'm done. And it's just a constant reminder when Sherry and I get home and we come back in our house and you hit the fresh air and I'm like, man, you really reek right now. And I smell everything. And it is just a constant reminder, man, I hate sin. I hate sin, but I love the people that it has its thumb on, pressing on them, keeping them held down. That's who I love. And yes, I will smell like, I will smell like smoke. Yes, I will guard myself against the temptation. I will do everything that the Word has told me to, but I will not stop loving them. I will stop, not stop giving them the gospel every day that I go out. We are to contend, and it's not by throwing fleshly punches. I saw on Facebook, okay, we responded to this horribly as a church, most, most, most of the church did. We got angry, and we got upset, and we started throwing punches. We started trying to make people believe what we believe. Did anybody save anybody over the weekend? Didn't happen. They actually dug their heels in as I was watching conversations. Why? Because that's not the way the gospel is to be presented to people. It's not an argument. It's a life changed in people seeing it and saying, you have something I don't have. That means I have to build a relationship with someone to bring in the gospel. Very few times do I ever meet somebody for the first time and get a chance to really put in the gospel. It happens on the street quite a bit because people are so desperate they want it. But not every American is at that point when they have 2.5 kids, a three-story house, three house, and a couple cars. They're not at the broken point yet. So they have to see something different. It's the relationship. And this cookie-cutter evangelism cannot work. Okay, put your tracks away, put all that stuff away. There's no written formula to do it. What he's saying here is we have to be in prayer with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to have to discern. Each person that we meet is different. They're not going to, some people you can compassionately win to the Lord. Some people you have to let them know that there is a fire and a judgment. It doesn't work the same, but we have to be in tune to the Holy Spirit to allow Him to let us do it, or we can't do it. We will fall on our face, and like Proverbs says, we'll push it too far, and they'll end up hating us. And we'll lose our witness because we're not listening to the, law or the uh, prompting of the Holy Spirit. We're not allowing Him to do the work. So our faith must impact us, and then our walk will impact others. It has to impact us first. And one thing that's vital as I'm listening to this, because this... This middle passage, was it's hard to listen to because it's a lot of darkness. But we are to operate and live, and Jude's about ready to close it up with this, as more than conquerors. What does that mean? More than conquerors. Conquerors walk in saying, I have a really good shot at winning this. I've won a lot in the past. Okay, That's a conqueror. But there's still a little bit of doubt. I've done it before, but I'm, I should be able to do this one. A more than a conqueror knows the battle's already won. The whole thing is already written, and I can see the end. I get through. We win. Okay? Romans 8.37 says this. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So we know the end of the story. We know what's going on. We're watching it just unfold. And why are we not surprised? It's because we're not being led by the Holy Spirit in all that we do. We are not walking in the Spirit like we should as a church, as a whole. Okay, It's going to take every person sitting in the seats to be able to take this gospel message to the city. It's not just the leadership. It's just not a couple of life group leaders. It's not a couple of ministry leaders. It is the body of Christ. In the, in the book of Acts, when those guys got it, they didn't have an education. They were fishermen. They were from all walks of life. They just took it out and went from house to house, and people were saved every day. Every day. So Jude closes with this precious prayer. And it should be our victory cry at the gates of hell. 
when we're seeing the darkness, when we're seeing, and, I, and I'm not kidding you, it will take its effect on you. When you are seeing people who have been ravaged by sin, it is hard. And it's a humbling place because you say to yourself, God, there is no way I can fix that. There is no way. I can look at that right now, and there's still something that comes up inside us, and it says, but I, I know someone who can. And this is the cry. It says, verse 24, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his, holy, or his glory with great joy. He's happy to do it. That's something that we don't realize. God delights in sanctifying, making us holy, more like him, getting us through all this. He delights in it. He wants to do it. He goes on to say in verse 25, To the only God... He's the only one. Our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Sometimes we forget we call Jesus the Savior, and that's true. But it's all because God the Father planned it. He is the Savior. He, Jesus Christ is the physical incarnation of what God was, who He is, His character, His nature. He's the perfect mirror of it. He's the one that delights in saving us. We often think God is just judgment. No, He is the one that orchestrated all of this to bring us a Savior, Jesus Christ. Be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now forever. Amen. So God is simply able to save us. He's going to love us. He's going to keep us for all eternity. And nothing that man or Satan can do will ever change that. And we'll finish Romans 8 here real quick to go along. Verse 38 says, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. That's everything under God. God is at the top. Anything that was created, that's everything else. will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ our Lord. So the call tonight from Jude is to remember the God that we serve. He is still in control, and we are to respond by contending for our faith. And maybe we've sat by, you're maybe one of the ones who have sat by too long and you've been too idle in your faith over time. Or maybe you're one of those ones that the event of this last week has shaken your faith a little bit. Okay? Well, we have the perfect opportunity with communion tonight. Repent. It's all it takes. God, I'm sorry for being shaken. I'm sorry for by sitting idle. And if you've been going in full force in faith, be careful the way we do it. We do it with respect and out of love. Okay? We don't throw punches. That's not how the gospel is delivered. Trust me, I want to do it sometimes, but it's not the way the gospel is delivered, okay? It won't work. It just causes division. So if you're going to do that tonight, it's a perfect reminder as we take communion, but not only communion here, but that's what the early church figured out. When we break bread at the house, when we break bread in fellowship together, when we're at a stranger, a non-Christian's house, and we break bread, we realize, wait a minute, this is my life. Food is my life. It gives me strength. That should give glory to God right there. That's a reminder. He's actually the one that gives me strength. He's the one that gives me life. He's the one that gives me purpose. That's it. And as the worship team comes back up, I want to read the scriptures tonight uh, of the communion. It just says in 1 Corinthians, it says, Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We are to proclaim our faith in Jesus. And if anything that's going on in the outside world tells us it's closer now than it has ever been. And we are to proclaim it and we are to be on mission for him.